I would like to welcome you to the 13th class in the uh, UBC Eco Ecosystem Modeling course called FISH 501. Today we're going to do something which I really try to do as much as possible during these courses, and that is to talk about practical aspects. And uh, the topic for that today is non-traffic effects. That's environmental forcing, habitat capacity, how we and how we deal with what we call mediation. If you followed the course, you heard a bit about that from two or at least two of the previous speakers. Uh, Jay Chagaris talked quite a bit about this, actually Jacob Metley too. And uh, last week, uh, Natalia, Natalia Sapetti talked about how she had been incorporating notably temperature into her non-spatial model from west of Scotland. That's what we'll be dealing with today. Uh, but before we get going on, on this, I would like to acknowledge that UBC is at Coast Salis territory. In addition, I would like to remind you that the recordings of, uh, are available on Ecopart's YouTube channel and on Facebook book on the Ecopart um, consortium channel there. Uh, also reminding you that the lectures are available, not just the lectures, but the uh, reading schedule, the tutorials, the assignments and so on are available uh, on the um, Google site for, for the course. That's basically it for the first part of the introduction. I'm going to see if I can... So dealing with non-traffic effects in ECOSIM is the topic for what we're doing here. First of all, when we want to incorporate environmental impacts, uh, there are two ways of, kind of two ways of doing it with just regards to things that change over time. And that's forcing functions, the first one. Forcing functions are sitting over here on, on ECOSIM, input, forcing functions. These forcing functions uh, can be used to uh, directly force a group or they can be used uh, with environmental preference functions and they still have an impact but they are used in a slightly different way. If you use them to force a group directly, first of all they have to be scaled relative to an echo part baseline. So one is the default and if there's just one in it it's not going to do anything, that's fine. Good way of testing it. So that's a way of forcing a consumer, a producer, the detritus, how it changes over time. That's what we can do with a forcing function. Now, if it uh, is as in the case that Natalia Sapati, Sapati talked about last week, a temperature, then we can also uh, read that in as an elemental response we're still a forcing function, but now it's scaled differently. It's scaled if it's temperature, it may be scaled 5, 10, or 15 degrees on the y axis, um, not having one as the baseline. So that's one really fundamental aspect of whether you read things in as a forcing function or as an environmental response. The forcing functions, when you read them in, they can be used, for instance, to force nutrient supply, prime production, or something else. Uh, they can force any group in the system. And you can get these forcing functions from other models or from data, whatever you have. A key factor there is that we need long-term time series for it. Typically, when we run models, uh, we need contrast in the data. And you don't con get contrast if you're just looking at a few years. When I talk briefly about this in connection with the EcoSim um, introduction a week ago, I showed the same graph that's here on the right, nutrient load into Chesapeake Bay. And that's a good example uh, for several reasons. One is we had to make this nutrient loading using a very, very simple model dynamic model that has river influx, nutrient loading in it, and then simple model of the Chesapeake Bay, hydrodynamic model. 
we couldn't rely on the very complex model that was there made by the Army Corps engineers because they only ran that model for 18 months. That's all they could do. It's a really complex model. It served a different purpose, not our purpose. We need to look at the long-term trends. So we model 55 years, uh, river inflow, uh, inflow from atmosphere, and uh, that was basically uh, what we considered in that. And came up with this function here that showed relative nutrient loading to Chesapeake Bay. And you can see how when you got into the 80s, uh, because of agricultural runoff, the nutrient loading coming into the bay more than doubled for some years. And when we got up into late 90, up in the 90s, they started uh, cleaning up and it uh, fell back again. When this function was put into ECOSIM, it resulted in the sum square residuals, so the fit to data uh, improving by 50%. So the sum, the, the, the sum square residuals fell 50%, just as a, a consequence of including this nutrient loading. Nutrient loading changes environmental productivity has impacts throughout the ecosystems. That's what, we, what is what we typically see. So uh, we can get this in and if it's a forwarding function, you need to scale it so that it has um, one in the first year, your EcoPath baseline as a rule, it has to be scaled. Well, another thing about these uh, forcing functions is if you have, for instance, a correlation with uh, the, some uh, thing like the PTO or the North Atlantic Oscillation Index or something else, you cannot expect that they scale the same way. So even if you take such an index and you have all productive periods, less productive periods, you may well have to change the amplitude as well. Um, in, in this case here, not, but it could be that this had a, a bigger impact or smaller impact. So we might have to scale it so that it would even go to three, and as you see here, but only to one and a half or whatever. And the only way of figuring that out is actually to trying it. Just be aware of it, that uh, when you have a relative series, you have to think about does it directly reflect what's, uh, what's happening or do you have to scale it? Could be the warmer temperature has a positive impact and you don't model that. If you only model that as a forcing function, so you scale it to one, you may have to reduce the amplitude in it. All right, next, how we implement them. We have this big equation here that you've seen a couple of times, at least by now, uh, for how we model consumption. And modeling consumption is the key to ecosystem. We are describing how uh, organisms change abundance over time. And that's linked to how much they consume because that consumption is turned into production. And that's what we're really interested in. The production in turn impacts the biomass change. So changes in productivity will impact the biomass change. When in this big equation, which um, there are a number of things happening, Look at it, it's pretty, a little bit scary. But uh, when it comes to forcing functions, they're not there directly, they impact some of these factors. Now they can impact, as you can see on the list, their search rate, vulnerability, or arena area or combinations for a consumer. Now, if they impact search rate, now you may remember, I talked about the lotka voltaire equations and Carl did too where we're modeling the consumption of a predator as how many predators are there times how many prey are there times a search rate. It's just a scaling factor um, that can be used in that situation. And we use it um, based on how many vulnerable prey there are, but that's where the vulnerability comes in. So we can impact that which basically means if we have the search rate here, if that one, if the fact the forcing function that we multiply on that is bigger than one, well, then they will be able to eat more. It increases that. 
for vulnerability, if we're impacting that, it kind of means the same thing, but it also means that we are moving, if we increase the vulnerability, we are saying that this group is further from carrying capacity. That's the impact of that's how it will work. So that would mean we get more of a top-down control and top-down control just means that two predators eat more than one predator. You know, more predators eat more. That's what top-down control means. It doesn't mean that they control the prey population. We talked about that in the last class I gave. Or it can impact. The third option you have is it in incorporates the arena area. How much arena area is there for a group inversely? But that's because it divides by arena area in the equation over here. That's where the arena area comes in. It's divided by it. Now, um, what you should, what should you do? The default here is to use forcing functions to impact search rate. And that's what I do, unless I want to try what happens if I do the other things and think about it and, uh, and explore it. And remember one of the key things you, you can do with a quick model uh, like those in, in quick models like those in EWE modeling framework is you can play with things. Uh, so you may want to try different things and see how the model reacts to it, but the default is the search trade. And unless you have good reason for it, then I would stick to that. You can get far with that and it uh, serves most purposes. Now that was for consumers. For producers, uh, this forcing function will impact um, the PP ratios. For the trieters, you can impact imports. And that's also possible. it's also possible now to impact other mortality. Um, that was developed by, um, by Dave Chagaris and Joe Buskowski and, and Jerome for um, dealing with red tide down West Florida. What do you do when you have a red tide coming in, killing fish? We put that in as not other mortality and it can, it's now a facility that can be used to model that directly so you can have these events coming in and uh, impacting mortality for the group, making them die off. So here is how such a function can look. And you can see for this one here, maybe you can see that it scales from 16 to, to here around 17. This is an example of a forcing function that's a bottom temperature. So what you can uh, deduct from that, if you have paid attention, is it is a forcing function that's being read in, but it's going to be used as an elemental response. And you can see that because again, it does not scale to one. Start at one, starts at 17. Um, they are all listed here in the forcing functions even if they are used as environmental responses. Okay, um, when we get into the environmental preference function, such as the temperature we were just looking at here, what they do is they impact the foraging arena size. So when we're calculating here, when you have this uh, foraging arena up there in the top right, over on the right side of that, you know, we have the vulnerable, uh, prey biomass and how much the predator eats is how many predators there are times how many vulnerable prey there are times a the search rate. So when we implemented this, we put in there, it also depends on the arena area. And that arena area is what we change with the environmental preference functions. Getting the data is a key factor and there are an increasing interest, I should say, because few, there are few publications yet about it, where we are coupling or linking uh, the EWE model, the EcoSim or EcoSpace to a hydrographic model, or most often spatial models. And the different, difference between coupling or linking, the terminology there is just that if we couple it, it's a it's considered a two-way uh, connection. If we link it, 
we're just reading files that come from uh, say a holographic, holographic model that we may be picking up salinity and temperature and oxygen currents maybe from the hydrographic model. And there's no feedback from the food web to the um, hydrographic model. One critical aspect of that is when we come to biogeochemical models, where you have a hydrographic model that models the water masses, and you have a biogeochemical model that also looks at nutrients and have um, phytoplankton, maybe of various kinds, and typically also zooplankton in it. Uh, if we take such a model and we couple it, we, we can couple that with a, for instance, a, a, a spatial ecosystem model. Then we have to figure out the handshake between those two. You know, we have to figure out do we, uh, who models zooplankton is typically the big question. Is it the biogeochemical model or the uh, ecosystem model, the higher trophic level model? And core there is what, yeah, the zooplankton from the ecosystem model, we can get how um, over how, how the uh, grazing pressure has changed for the zooplankton. Or what we increasingly are seeing is that the biogeochemical model stops with phytoplankton and the ecosystem model includes zooplankton and then provides a grazing pressure on the phytoplankton. Um, that has some advantages. But this is still very much uh, research in, in uh, work in progress, let's call it that. So next point, any number of environmental preference functions. Yeah, you can have, uh, you can have many. I think I have one model that has, I don't know, 150 maybe, something like that, a spatial model. And uh, uh, it works fine, no problem. Can be used in ecosystem and ecospace, but it has to be spatial fields and ecospace. That's pretty much straightforward. If it is ecospace, the way it works is that for each cell on the map, we look up however many preference functions there are. In this case here, we have four preference functions. So for each of those preference functions, we look up what's the value in a given cell. And then we go up on this graph and we translate that into a reaction for the group that is impacting. And we do that for each of the four. And then these values that come out of that, we multiply those on top of each other. And it really constrains where on the map that the um, groups may be occurring. That's an echo space. In principle, we could do exactly the same in the echo system. So we could uh, look at temperature, salinity, oxygen, and depth, for instance, to a model where a group occurs. But because it's not spatially explicit, that would basically mean no group could occur anywhere because getting combinations of all these parameters right, you can't do that because in a, in a time dynamic model, because in there you have one temperature, one depth, one salinity, one oxygen, and it fits no one. So when you're working with this, you can do as Natalia did last week, it can even make sense to do it, to look at the impact of one factor, like the average temperature, what kind of reaction do we, can we expect to see? That's simpler than addressing the same question using a spatial model. And generally, you know, using a simpler model is preferable. So if you can address it with a simpler model, then try using a simpler model to address it. You can always make things more complicated by going and adding to it and making it spatial, making it more detailed and so on. Start simple and then generally, then gradually work your way through the more complicated. That's preferable way of handling things. So how do you get them in? When we're talking about the environmental preference functions, and we're going to see this very soon in, in the tutorial. I'm going to be doing two tutorials in today. Um, 
for in this case here, we have a temperature preference. Uh, so there is a forcing function here for temperature hidden somewhere up in forcing functions. But now we're looking at the environmental responses and we're defining here a temperature function that looks like you see it here. So up here is, is the shape with a solid red. And uh, actually you can see there, there are quite there are 10 different environmental response functions in this model here. And over here, where we defined the environmental uh, preference functions, we have added to it temperature down at the x-axis. So when we for, uh, in the, if it's an ecosystem, if we know how the temperature changes, uh, we will know how to look up here, what the implications are on that. Um, once you define it, you also have to apply it. So first, uh, First, we define it. And you can see over here on, on the left, the metal responses, and we have apply and momentum responses next. That's where we're going here. We're clicking, like in this case here, clicking the, inter the relationship between cut and the forcing function T button brings up this menu here, or this pop up screen. And in this pop up screen, we can say what function we want to have in there. So in this case here, clicked number five, temperature cold. I'm clicking here. And the next thing is click the green button here, which will move that function over here. Now in this function here, it's right now it's an echo sim. What it does is it looks up the forcing function T button and it puts the values from there into this histogram. So that gives you right away a reference about an uh, indicator of whether you are uh, in the right ballpark. Uh, does this, uh, what, what you have here, does that make sense? Um, like if all the values were out here on between 25 and 30 degrees in the, uh, in the time, in the forcing function, then you would know that, oh, uh, you're making a mistake or something is, something is off. That's what it amounts to. Getting the data, we talked a bit about Acromaps and, uh, and they are uh, neat because they basically cover all fish species. And uh, if you go to, uh, and, and basically also a lot of invertebrates, uh, thanks to uh, sea life base. So this connects to fish life and uh, to fish base and sea life base. We get this information. You can see here in the graph, you can get depth water temperature, you see reaction to depth, water temperature, salinity, primary production, sea ice, uh, box, uh, oxygen, bottom oxygen, and distance to land as the ones that, and you can decide which ones you want to extract and they can be brought straight into uh, ecospace for instance. That's about it. Are there any questions about forging functions before we move on? Hey. It's not clear to me what's the dif what's the difference between a forcing function and environmental response say, apart from the scaling. That doesn't really need to be any if we're talking ecosim. Uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't need the uh, to have the environmental forcing strictly speaking in there. Let me give you the history instead. We had forcing functions in ecosim for a long time years, and then. Some years ago, we introduced um, habitat capacity in ecospace. And it's very much related to it. So we, we did all of what was needed to get habitat capacity. And habitat capacity is using the environmental preference functions. And it's using spatial forcing functions. So how the environment changes spatially. It's the one that uses the graph that I showed before, where you have the four or five different parameters multiplied on top of each other. We realized that we could use exactly the same in ecosims. It may be easier for you to grasp it if you're using the environmental preference functions because then uh, a species reacts to temperature that has the right unit and you read it in as the right unit rather than scaling it. It may also uh, matter because if you rescale it, how should you rescale it? 
uh, you have more flexibility on that with your momentum preference functions. So generally I would say, uh, I can see the sense in, uh, I would recommend to use it as environmental preference functions if it's things like temperature that you're dealing with. If it is how prime productivity changes over time or something of that kind, that's more like, that's more, to me, that's more like a forcing function. I mentioned the story of this last time about down lenses in Santa Barbara how the fish biologists were very happy with the notion that when you started fishing tuna, uh, there would be fewer tuna and therefore there would be more small pelagics, and this would lead to more um, prey available for the albatrosses in that area. And that was great for the fish biologists for not for the ones working with birds who realized that that was not what had happened. And this is what led to inclusion of mediation into um, EWE, Ecosim and Ecospace. This is being carried over from Ecosim to Ecospace because it's not a spatial thing. It may be analyzed spatially, but the function itself is not spatial. The, uh, the idea about this Oh, the concept here is that a group, the mediator, can have an impact on the interaction between a predator and its prey. And this system here, tuna mediates the interaction between small pelagics and albatrosses. And they do that by scaring the small pelagics up to a warm surface layer where they become accessible to small pelagics. Now, it has also been demonstrated the opposite effect, that if you have an area where there are many surface birds, they will scare the small pelagic down in the water column. So actually albatrosses can also um, mediate the interaction between tuna and, and their prey. It can work back both way. And one of the really critical things that uh, we're doing with um, generally with the EWE modeling is actually to get that behavior aspects, behavioral aspects into the modeling. It's not Lotka Voltaire, it's not just simple mass action. The whole foraging arena is dealing with that. And we can add mediation to it as a direct process that we can at least um, think about in our head. It's getting numbers for this is, is, is difficult, but it's one of the things that we can uh, include in the models. And this is a good example because when it was included in the model, it was because of a model failure. The model said that the fewer tuna led to more small pelagics, and that would lead to more albatrosses, which is not what would happen. It had led to less albatrosses, still more small pelagics, but they would just be deeper in the water column because there were fewer tuna to scare them up to the surface. So model failures is how we learn and these functions can be used for that purpose. Now, there are many other examples of where you can maybe wanting to use uh, mediation mentioned here a few. Uh, you can have um, kelp being uh, hiding places for juvenile fish, feeding places too, there can, be, uh, there can be production on those that will directly benefit it. But this interaction with hiding place will lead to those that want to eat the juvenile fish have less access to them because they can hide. Trawling, when you're trawling with um, the doors, trawl doors on the bottom can lead to V suspension that leads to more primary production. You model that by effort. Changes in efforts relative can lead to having the direct impact on this primary production. Trawling may also be crushing things on the bottom, the trawl doors again, and making them available to crabs and other 
things that eat um, other scavengers. One we often see is primary production leading to uh, causing shading that uh, impacts the macroalgae. Um, a good example of this is the, um, saw one a few years ago in, in, in Denmark, where there'd been an uh, invasion of uh, small mussels, dressed mussels. Now that had left, uh, resulted in the clearing of a lake uh, and because the, these mussels were just eating all the phytoplankton. The impact of that was in the, what, in the streams leading out from that, microalgae was suddenly having, uh, benefiting from this. And uh, that increased microalgae led to flooding because it just, the water couldn't get out, it was clear water, great uh, lights and nutrients um, made available for the macroalgae and they grew and they stopped the water. So it was flooding the whole area. Pretty neat stuff. Um, fat tuna boats, tuna impact there. We, uh, we haven't incorporated that yet, but that's the kind of things where it can be used for. So there, there are many different cases here and it's worthwhile when you think about it, especially if you see the model is not behaving. Could there be something missing in the model? That's always one of the very important questions to ask when you're dealing with a model. It's being in, uh, implemented in ways, uh, the mediation that are very similar to how we do with forcing function. So it can impact the search rate, that's the default. It can also be a vulnerability or arena area or combination of it. For producers, it's PB on the try this is still import. Um, when you set this up, as you'll see in a little while, uh, you can have several groups serving as mediators. And I'm using the example here, uh, well, when we do that, we need to say, have a weighting factor for how much the biomass uh, contribute to this. Um, different, like in this example here, so a big 100 kilogram tuna, is it as scary as uh, 520 kilograms albacores? Or if it is, then the weighting factor is the same. Or are five 20 kilo albacore, are they scary, more scary than uh, 100 kilo tuna? Like it's the, it's the number of tuna that matters, then the, the weighting factor for albacore should be five and one for, for uh, big eye. So that's one thing you have to uh, think about when you, uh, when you implement this. And how you implement it is here. The first thing is to define a, a shape. And uh, you get, when you open up here in, in the mediation, um, actually up there on the first mediation, you can make such a shape here. There are various ways of doing that, including freehand or user function. And it would be really nice if we could just go out and ask some people uh, how this shape should be defined. But you probably can't get anyone to do it. So you'll have to, um, you'll have to try and see what impact does it have on your research question. Uh, Tim Essington looked at that and that's one paper about that for about 10 years ago about this for uh, shape of these functions. But um, yes, they matters but uh, you can, you will have to try, see uh, what you think is a reasonable relationship and use that. And then you can say, what happens if I change it? The assumptions in it, how much impact does it have? And that's, what, that's the way we have to work. So we define a shape and uh, that shape there is, um, in this case here, you have to, you have to specify uh, what's on the axis here. And that's what we do in the next here where we apply the mediation to a consumer. That's why we go out and we specify. You have to specify um, in this case here, it would be, we don't, I don't know what this is going to be for, but it's something where uh, when there are few of this group, 
they have, there's a big in, uh, there's a lot of interaction between whatever prey predator it is eating whatever prey. When there are a lot of the mediator, there's very little interaction between whatever predator it is and whatever prey it is. We define that next, but that's how this shape works. Um, so this is the kind of shape that could be used for the tuna. It could say, if there are, no, it's just the opposite. Uh oh, it's just the opposite. The tuna one would look the other way. It would go, uh, it would be the other way. It would be down here when there are few tuna, there's little interaction between albatrosses and small pelagics. When the, there's a lot of tuna, there's going to be a lot of interaction between the albatrosses and the small pelagics. So the other way around. Now you'll notice one more thing here. That's this line that's there. That line, which you can move with your cursor, represents the Ecopart baseline. So for whatever this is, it basically says that if there are fewer of the mediator, because this is this axis here, x axis is the mediator. It's what was before the tuna or the kelp, the mediator. Fewer of them doesn't really matter, but more of them, that's when you see less interaction between the given predator and the given prey. And you can just move that if you move it out, uh, out here instead, uh, it will still have a big impact. But you can be, um, if you, yeah, well, if you move all to the left here, then uh, like all the way over there, then 10 times as many of the mediator would have very little impact. It's only when you get below up to 20 times as many that uh, it would have an impact. So that's um, the significance of this line. And so you have to be aware of that. So once you define that, once you define the function, once you define the Ecopart baseline, then you can say what's going to be applied to. In this case here, it's going to be, a, uh, no, sorry, what's the mediator? In this case here, seals seems to be the mediator because they're pushed over here. So it's the number of seals that has some kind of impact. And this is the silly example from uh, that, that we're going to be show, dealing with in the uh, in the tu for, in tutorial uh, a little bit later in this class. Here uh, we found when we apply the mediation, the next here, number four, it's applied to the intersection of macro eating anchovy. So that's uh, got in here, clicked that uh, cell there and bringing up this and moving it over here. So we have applied it to that in this case here. We'll talk more about that when we get to the, um, when we get to the tutorial pretty soon. Um, another question is use environmental forcing or mediation. It's usually much clearer when you, when, once you deal with it. Temperature, salinity, oxygen, pH, and so on, that's environmental forcing. Uh, light is typically mediation noise and shipping and seismic exploration. Um, if it impacts the feeding, as you see in the example next, then it's mediation. If it impacts the production directly, it's a forcing. So you have to think about it and uh, there may be different ways of doing things, but um, it's flexible. That's what it boils down to. Last slide here. This is a work that I remember her first name did for, um, it was just a master project in open. So it's using the spatial model that um, Natalia Sapetti uh, was um, mentioned uh, last Thursday uh, in her in the discussion after her lecture. She was mainly talking about a non-spatial model of this area west of Scotland, but uh, they also, they've also developed a spatial model for there and that's what Harvey was using for, for this master study. And uh, in this example, she was looking at the impact of vessel traffic. And that's what you see on the graph, lower left graph here, uh, of noise from these vessels on harbor porpoises. 
And she did that by putting up a, uh, a mediation function with different shape that then talked about shipping would be the mediator and it's cell specific shipping, how much traffic there was in, in, in each spatial cell impacted how well harper porpoises could find their prey. And she tried three different shapes for it and came up then with an evaluation of what this um, traffic, what kind of impact it might have on the harbor porpoises. And noise is a big topic. And this is the kind of applications we are bound to see many more of. Enough. I'll stop sharing and ask if there are questions before we go to the tutorial. I had a question about the um, environmental response and mediation shapes. Can you put in um, empirical data to create one of those shapes or is there a mechanism in ecosim to, to fit a model to that? Or would you model outside of that, outside of ecosim and then put in a representative shape it makes most sense, most, uh, it's most often applied spatially. So you could imagine then, if we, if we think of it spatially, that you have a, a large number of survey points. And uh, from those surveys, you have, uh, you have depth. Let's say, assume it's a, a, a bottom fish of some kind. So you have, you have depth, uh, you may have salinity, you may have temperature, maybe currents, um, and that kind of factors. So you could simply go in and plot that and see uh, how does that how how, how does the biomass of uh, cod depend on react to temperature or depend on temperature? It's not really depending on it because what we're seeing is an emerging property. But if you assume that they are where they are because they like the temperature and they, the, the fish are where they are because they like the salinity and they like the oxygen level and so on, you can get these four or five shapes that uh, I showed in the previous graph here. It's the habitat capacity. And when you multiply those together, you get a you constrain and it can actually in, we've seen a number of cases where it actually represents the actual distribution really well, which is neat because that gives us a handle on um, how things may change, for instance, when temperature changes or, or other factors changes. The downside of this is, of course, we are assuming that those environmental factors are what, uh, what are um, this determining the distribution. Yeah. It would also be that it's predators, that they are in this place because they are, it's a refugium for, 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 uh, for predators and that, that we really should be looking at that. Or I could see, for instance, temperature confounded with season, what looks like, particularly maybe with recruitment, what looks like a preference for warmer temperature might be just the late season recruitment yeah. pulse. And uh, the nice thing about this is there's nothing new in this. Oh, no. Comforting thing about this is there's nothing new in that. We know that yeah, temper uh, depth and temperature are, are correlated and we may have to deal with that. But that's pure, that's, that's mm -hmm. what we talk about in statistics all the time. Yeah. So, that, so, uh, so we can deal with this. The neat thing about this is we can ask the questions and we can explore them. And the outcome is promising of this. Uh, we've used this, um, for instance, we'll be talking about using this in the connection with the Roberts Bank Terminal work uh, in a month's time or something like that. And in that case, it's gone through the strictest review process I've ever been involved in. You'll, you'll hear more about this one in a month's time. Uh, but um, it passed through that. I mean, the outcome of that was, yeah, this is probably the best way of doing it. Best we can do now with the information we have. It's flexible. 
uh, it's once you grasp the mechanics of it, it's fairly easy to do. And what is really important is that it provides a link between bottom up and top down processes. And on evaluating the effect there, we have the handle for addressing all of that. Uh, we can look at the ecosystem effects combined with the environmental effects in a meaningful way. That's a really critical aspect of this. Problems that you are talking about, Holden, that's what turns it into science. Hi, Neely. I have a question. Do you have like any examples of uh, people that did ground, ground truthing on, on those like mediation function shapes? If we're talking about things like uh, like the mediation shapes? Yeah. Getting empirical data for it. Mm -hmm. uh, extremely difficult. Yeah, it's what I thought. Yes. Uh, I hope it will inspire research. Mm -hmm. but um, no and in many cases we, we have an idea about these mechanisms uh, I'm sure we've all heard in ecology that kelp serves as a refugia for, um, for juveniles mangrove exactly the same now how do you you know you can get that in of course in, if, it's, if it's clear in, in the if it really is in a spatial model and you have mangrove, then the predators and, you do, and the predators don't get into the mangroves. Of course, that you don't even need mediation in that case. Um, but what happens when if you cut down the mangrove, they disappear from you. Then you will see um, you can you can have that. With mediation, you don't have to change the habitat. It's just the biomass of uh, mangrove goes down, and then. But getting the shape for that, it, you have to try it out. But the mechanism—that's what I'm trying to say. The mechanisms are something we often know about. That there are these mechanisms, and we've known that for a long time. But here we are actually modeling it. What the, what are the implications of that? And I think that's really, uh, that's neat that, we, that, that we're doing that. So um, I'm happy with us reaching that level and use every opportunity to then uh, talk to people about uh, how do, can you help us get some empirical information about this? Okay, that's, where, that's, that's kind of where you're going with this. That's what we should do. And anything that helps uh, the communication between people, researchers in different silos, I think it's a fantastic thing. Marta? Yeah, I, was, um, I would like to add that, for example, there is uh, cases like when you recover or restore habitat-forming species, as uh, I believe a saying, corals, kelp, um, sea grasses that you all of a sudden see that you are missing some important ecological roles that these species are playing. And it's when, when you build these models and you have those species there that you realize that something is missing and it's when you bring these uh, effects in. Because if you think about the role that they play just with the, with the prey predation relationships, the ecological interactions that, that you include with prey predation relationships are not enough. So that's, a, that's yeah. a good reason to include them. And, and that's a really good point. And um, I mentioned before the Roberts Bank work where we had seagrass. And uh, we also uh, would, in that case, we would also have mediation that seagrass have a mediation, mediate, they serve as mediators uh, and serve as hiding places. Now, we did not build that into the model, but we were aware, aware of it. So instead, we talked about in the discussions about this, that that effect was not in, and therefore that the increased, the better conditions for, that we saw for seagrasses in this area um, would have had an effect that we didn't incorporate. So we're kind of conservative by not incorporating it and not having to explain everything about it in this, this review process. But just being aware of this, even if you don't put it in the model, 
uh, is something that's worth discussing and considering. It's a process. You don't need to do everything, but knowing about that this possible or what the implications would be um, you know, situation of maybe I should try it, incorporate it. And a really nice thing about these models is that they're fast. So actually trying it tends to be quick. The uh, tutorials are on the course website, uh, number seven and eight, I think they are. And um, we will go there and there we have environmental incorporating environmental forcing. So we are going to do a temperature button, T button function and uh, we are going to see with what happens in uh, Anchovy Bay uh, when we uh, use that function. So let's see if we can figure that out. One more thing I could close. There we are, virtual box. Uh, I want a really simple model. So I'm going to check which one to open here. Anchovy Bay tutorial, that sounds great. This is the uh, a very simple model that I constructed in the tutorial. So it doesn't have much in it. So we have Andrew Bay. We're going to go to Ecosyn. We're going to be working on, oh, it's funny. I was uh, working on this, this, trying this out this morning and uh, the computer behaved absolutely well until I uh, started Zoom. Oh, what's happening now? Oh, come on. It's working, Billy. Can you see anything? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I have some strange issues. Uh, I'm, uh, I just opened Ecosim and I'll do what I always do when I get into Ecosim. I run it. I just want to see uh, if it's behaving. It's doing quite a lot here. I probably have some um, things happening with regards to the fleets. Yeah, I have trawler effort going up quite a lot. Let's read in the time series. No, let's not read in the time series. Let's just do the mechanics of getting it, getting it in because there is a time series that I might not want in there yet. Um, we're going to go to forcing functions. And uh, we have now a Bottom temperature here, but it's a flat line, and we have a dummy, so we have two uh, temperature functions. And uh, let's go back and see what it is we want to do. We're going to set up environmental responses. Okay. Uh, Ecosim input element responses. Ecosim input environmental responses. Okay, we have one here. We can that. Uh, I could go values. So here we can actually uh, copy them in. Uh, Whatever it is, uh, that's what it's for. I can't remember what to call it. I just changed the name of it. So we have a fortune function here. Now, what are we going to do? Oh, it's going to be writing T. Once more. Mm -hmm. 
Billy, there is a couple of questions in the chat regarding the CSV file. Uh, I wasn't able to find the CSV file with the bottom T. And then oh no, um, it's a different word. I have so many versions of it, and it was it's, it was missing in the one I put up. Uh, I will. Uh, We will just uh, get by without it. I'll show you how. We have basically, if we take that first, we need to, we need, so we need this bottom temperature here. Is e minus one, it's just a forcing function read in. In the time series, I do have a different one. One way of doing this is just uh, go in here and put a value here. Now the temperatures are around um, 14 degrees or something like that. Oh, so I just, um, I can reset, try it once more. I'm, I'm moving too fast. We, we don't want to have something that scales to one. We want to have something that has a value around 10, 15 degrees. That's the temperature range. We can get there by just doing like this and then get up to 14. To, to make it quick, I'm going to values here instead. And in here in the values, I, um, oops, doesn't work. I go values and I click values. It brings up this interface. And I'll just go and I'll put in a value somewhere here of 14. It's, oh, once more. 14, just for the scaling of it. And now I have my bottom temperature defined. This is what was in the CSV file. Shape, don't worry about it. It's just something that changes over time. A um, little bit of uh, contrast is great. So now we have a bottom temperature file, the one that was supposed to be in the CSV file. Could look something like this. The shape is not uh, uh, important, but keep it between the 10 and, and 15, 18, 18 degrees or something like that. That's the range we're talking about. So we have that now. And we're going to go to environmental responses. So in here, we want to um, change the shape. And what's suggested in the user guide is that we use a trapezoid here. That's what we get from, um, from Acromaps, for instance. If they are the right or not, is something we have to explore and we, have, we need much more information about that. We heard more about that uh, in, we heard about that last Thursday. But for this here, I'll just use this. Uh, oh, 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 I'm getting, I'm skipping down to the number. Um, because there's another way of doing that. I carefully read through this and uh, I see I've done it in the tutorial slightly different from how I would normally do it. And 15, 16, 19. I put those in here, 10. Sorry for this going to be a little bit confusing. I'm not doing it exactly as in the tutorial. Now I put in that those numbers. So I go in my mental response. I take this trap head switch and I put in 10, 15, 16, and 19. That's my shapes. And then I get this shape here. Um, next thing, I can't see all of it. I define the shape here. That's the shape I want. 
I put in here, if you see, look at the bottom, 10, 15, 16, and 19 as the um, temperatures for, that defines this shape here. So the next thing after this is to define the response here on, on this shape, on this form here. This is where we can go in and we can then say uh, it's whiting and it's bottom temperature. We want to apply it to that. So I click whiting, I click bottom temperature and I click the little green arrows here, arrow here. And now you see um, whiting has been assigned to the bottom temperature. So this is the functional group that's been applied to bottom temperature that is going to be used for that. On the plot down here in the lower right corner, you can see the in the histogram, you can see the values from the time series, the forcing function, not time series, the forcing function we sketched a few uh, minutes ago. So they are here and um, the trapezoid shape then defines what, we, what it is we have for uh, defined for whiting. So we are seeing in this one here that we are at the lower to optimum range of the temperature here. Now I have a sense that I have to click for OK down there, but we have a scaling issue. Let me try it. If that is OK, it probably was OK. We can check that by going into apply environmental forcing here. And here we see that bottom temperature and white are connected. I could also have done it here and suddenly now everything looks fine. There are, um, there are more than one ways to, is it to skin a cat? Does anyone do that? It's a weird expression. There are more than one ways to do things. That's what it boils down to. And here, yeah. Uh, things look pretty okay. That's about it. We can uh, now go and run EcoSim and if Santiago had uh, been paying attention, he would have reminded me to use, as he has done before, show multiple runs. I'm still going to do that. And uh, we have a run here now. Actually, we have a run here that might work. See what happens. Whoops, we have the two runs. It actually worked. It's writing we want to look at. And we can see in run one and run two. Big difference. So this is what comes from um, incorporating this environmental productivity. Made it a little bit confusing by not doing it exactly as in the tutorial. Uh, that's because I don't look in the tutorial when I'm doing it. The steps involved to repeat it are, you need to have a time series with your forcing function. And uh, you can get that from whatever source is there or you can even go in and you can say, well, we are modeling this period here. Uh, Oh, I'm losing my mouse. Um, oh, it's starting doing random things. Oh, boy. Uh, give me a second. That's better. So um, now I should be able to use my mouse again. We could even go in and say, well, uh, what if what if temperature are going to be increasing uh, in the next 20 years by this much or the next 100 years, or whatever you want to run it, whether you can always go into Ecosystem parameters and change the, the number of runs. Uh, what kind of impact would such an, oh, that was not enough there, increase of two degrees have on whiting. 
go back and run it even without data. And now in one tree writing, we're getting this JP with, the, with this function here that I just sketched. So you can do it this way. You can sketch it if you don't have data and explore it. You can explore the impact of different shapes and so on. Um, but of course, it's nice to use things like if you use Acromaps, for instance, you can say I'm using Acromaps and it comes from there and treat it as if it was good data uh, and then see what are the implications of that. Then you can always say, what if things aren't like an Acromaps and add to it? Uh, it's flexible and, ooh, I don't think we have a way of, we talked about that uh, last week Jerome uh, talked about what if we could read in different forms. Um, right now, we don't have a facility that would take different shapes and, and seeing what the implications are of that. Uh, that's something we could add to it, but it's actually also something that uh, anyone who's interested in it could add. Uh, we have the system of plugins, and uh, Jerome will probably be talking about that a little bit later. Uh, but we, these plugins are snippets of code that can be used to do things over and over again. And it, it, developing such one is um, quite straightforward. We have guidelines for how to do that. And that could be done in that. So one could try, instead of having uh, one shape, one could try a thousand different shapes uh, with some based on some criteria and, and then look at what are the implications of using different shapes. Of, one way of doing it. Or you can do it manually by taking 10 different ones, of course, but uh, the other things is feasible as well. I think this pretty much covers um, elemental forcing. So can I uh, ask if there are questions about how you do this? I don't see the question, so someone will have to to speak up or direct this, Santiago. We have a question from Holden. Go ahead, Holden. Uh, it was more just a comment that it seems like that would be a good AI task to um, test these different shapes and over and over again, and then maybe see if it could fit um, and determine the best shape. These. Yeah, there's a there's a neat uh, neat little study there and paper. Absolutely. Anything else about this? It's flexible um, and pretty straightforward to implement once you get the hang of it. Let me load this one again. We just kicked everything we just did out away with it. And we're going to do the same again. Now we're going to go echo sim, no output. And just, and we're going to go run echo sim. And we see a lot of things happening. I'm going to check seals. And we see a nice increase in seals. Um, in Israel, there's a decline, a decline here, which it has to do with uh, uh, there was culling going on, and then that stopped, and we see two and a half times more seals. So they're going to be changing over time. Uh, the real silly thing that I was showing in the um, presentation about mediation, and uh, which I'm going to be implementing now, is that what if seal impacts the access. Uh, for the access to anchovy by macro. And it's, it's a little bit silly. It's not a good example in the sense that uh, you would have to imagine, imagination is great, uh, that seals hang around the uh, anchovy schools and somehow protect them uh, from macro. Okay. <laughs> It's difficult to imagine that, so it's not the best example, but um, that's the one I chose for this tutorial. So let's see what we do. We go echo sim, 
we go input, we find mediation. Nothing. Okay. That means we go down and we add down here a function like that. So now we have a function. Next, we want to shape it. So we go up here to the top to change shape. Oh, almost there. I use this thing because that slows me down. And now we have this uh, function, this form popping up uh, where we can choose how we want the shape to look. Choose it because no one can really tell us. Now, what we had was that if there are many seals, seals are going to be our x-axis. If there are many seals, there's going to be little interaction. So we could do a sigmoid. Ah, it's the wrong way. This here means lots of seals, lots of interaction between the predator and its prey. So we have to figure out how to turn this one around. Let's try one, zero. That's more like it. We can, yeah, we can try different things and so on. This is not really important. The main thing is we are getting a shape this way. Um, and we say, okay. So now we have a shape up here. The x-axis is going to be seals, but the model doesn't know it yet. What it does know is this is where our echo part baseline is. That's what's represented with this blue line. So we can grab that blue line and we can say that in the start situation, I'm going to do it like this. Uh, the start situation is here or it's here. So if we put it out here, any change away from the starting situation would have a great impact. See that? As soon as you start changing a little bit, it would have a great impact. We could also put it down here. Now I'm saying, um, initially there are so few seals in the system that they, it doesn't really matter, you get a few more. You have to have many times more before they have an impact. Or if, um, if this shape, Oh, I can't, I can't do it manually here. Uh, oh, let me just change the shape. Um, Max is going now going to be 0.2. No. I didn't do it. That is a way of doing that. No, that's the most. Oh. oh. Oh, come on. Try Command Shift. To recapture the, almost the mouse. Yeah. I just need to get this little part. <laughs> it's really weird when uh, this, these things work absolutely fine until we have a, a call like this with Zoom. Um, what I want to show you was if I, if I do like this, then it's going to say more seals doesn't matter. It's only less seals that matters. You have that flexibility. And there's a lot of different shapes that can be used for this. Uh, let's put it somewhere where we're going to see a reaction. We're going to see uh, quite a big increase in seals. So we can put it somewhere here where we see, oh, right away, that's going to be an impact. 
I could make it go all the way down, but uh, that might be too far. Doesn't really matter. Now we put this in. So we defined the shape, we defined where echo part baseline is or echo sim baseline. The echo sim baseline is what's in echo part, of course, belongs to this. So the next thing we have to do now is to define the mediating groups and fleets. It can be fleets as well, it can be effort that has an impact. So we click down there and we get this um, screen. And here we are looking for our mediator, which is seals. So I click seals. We have an arrow to the right, which is not green this time. And it goes over there. Uh, if I had said that, okay, whales are also part of this, I would get this, it's represent uh, the biomasses in um, of whales and seals. So whales have a bigger start biomass than seals. But if I put in here different weights saying, oh, but seals are much more scary than whales, right, if you are a macro, then suddenly I put 10 there and now we see seals dominate down here. So this pie chart just represents the biomass of the mediator groups, mediating uh, mediators times the, the, bio, the, the weight factor. And that produces this outcome here. So you can have several mediating groups, but we don't want whales. I'm going to remove those. Um, doesn't really matter what the relative weight is, but for simplicity, let's use one. So now I've defined that seals are the mediator and that shows up here. First couple of steps are done. What's remaining now is to go into apply mediation consumer and then find the interactions interaction or interactions that are of interest. In our case, it's macro, interaction between macro as a predator up there with anchovy down there. I click there and this shows up, this form, this, uh, form here. We have one mediating shape, which I should have renamed as we did for the temperature. Click that and it moves over to the right. So now it's applied and it's applied to search rate by default. You can also do vulnerability, you can do arena area, you can do combination of vulnerability and arena area. Um, you have to to consider what you think is, is um, the proper one. There is no correct way of doing this. You can test it. You can, if you test it, but no, you can, no, I was thinking of if it's a paper, but uh, you can, you can try things. The default is search rate for, because that's the one that's easiest to understand and it makes some, some sense, but you have options. Okay, we'll apply it. So you have mediation function one is now to in, uh, apply to the interaction between macro and anchovy. So let's run it. Multiple runs. Yes, I remember it. Fantastic. And we run again. So run one, and we're looking at macro. No, don't want to hold. You can see there's a slight difference as you move out to the right. That's where the biomass has increased enough to, to make a difference. There's not very much before then. Interesting. What about entry? Does it have any impact there? One. Oh yeah. 
uh, the reaction of macro decreasing leads to an increase in anchovy. They are being protected. We could go back then and say, oh, that's when it looks like this. Uh, if we go out and move that and we run it again. Macro, one, two, three. So you see a much bigger response. So which one is the correct one? Nobody knows. You can, you have to explore this. That's what it boils down to. Um, common sense uh, is, is a good guide for it. Um, time series, of course, great. Experiments, should there be someone actually experimenting with how big that impact is, would be marvelous, but not straightforward to do. But this is uh, providing some flexibility and ways of incorporating processes, even if we have difficulties quantifying these processes, uh, it's still pretty neat that we can get them in just like this. That's the mechanics of how to incorporate mediation into EcoSim. And EcoSpace, by the way, picks this up exactly the same way. And it uh, looks at the biomass. In this case here, it would look spatially at the biomass of seals and let that impact for a given cell the interaction between Racco and Hanshuvi. Questions? No? Billy, I, I just have a question. Do you know if uh, the mediations um, travel to Ecospace? Oh, they do, absolutely. They do? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. These, they're not spatial, so they depend on the biomass by cell. And that's something we know. So Does they the for yeah. No, because the forcing functions, they don't, right? Uh, the environmental response, uh, not, uh, not if you put in, a, like here, if you put in this uh, button temperature that we had before, it would not be moved over because uh, if we moved it over and make it, how are we going to specialize it? Um, we've, had a sim we've had the question for primary production. Oh, prime production is higher, but everywhere, uh, you know, they have to be spatial, these kind of environmental parameters. So uh, forcing functions, no, they don't move over. You have to use a temporal spatial framework to read them in, uh, or you have to use, you know, you can do it in, in echo space, just having maps with temperature, but then they don't change over time. Um, but, um, a flat temperature like uh, like Natalia had for west of uh, Scotland in her paper and presentation last week, we don't know how to move that over to, to Ecospace. So uh, you'll have to tell Ecospace how to do that. Uh, Billy, we have a question from Holden. Ah, the environmental response, is, you said that um, the user guide suggests the trapezoid shape. Um, I assume that's for temperature. Is there a reason that that's put in or that that seems to work better than a more continuous shape, like a normal distribution? Um, I don't even know if the, if the user's guide recommends it, but we often use it because of Acromaps. This is the default. This is what's in Acromaps. That's what Acromaps calculates. So I'm, I could pass the buck here to Acromaps and saying we're using it because it would be true. We, we are often using it because what's in Acromaps. It was part of our discussion with Natalia last week uh, where I think the default is you use the 10 and 90% percentile in, in those trapezoids. And 
I don't know what the good if there's any good arguments for that. And Natalia also talked about you, you know, using different and using a shape instead, um, which probably makes a lot of sense. So no, I'm not, I'm not at all convinced that the trap is, is the right way to go. Um, Marta will in a, I say in a month's time, one of the last lectures is going to be about the global spatial model that she's leading the work on. In that one, we're picking up for, Mark, do you want to explain how, uh, how it's done there? Because there's a trapezoid with something on top of it. Uh, well, what we are doing is we are basically modifying the trapezoids with uh, the Q10 um, factor, which basically modifies the the rates, the metabolic rates, uh, according to a temperature a correction where the species are. Yeah. So yeah, we are doing that per per cell, per per functional group. I see. So using that. Uh model climate change. Yeah. And the, diff the, the special thing about the mod that model, the Echo Ocean model, is that it's global, a global spatial model. So mm -hmm. we're dealing with Arctic and tropical conditions in the same model. So, so it really is necessary to, to deal with this. The Q10 factor may not be as important if you are looking at a system where there's only a few degrees difference uh, in temperature. For a different, that, that that's what's going to be experienced or for a functional group, uh, not 30 degrees as in, 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 in the model of Mars we'll be talking about there. Yeah, there is no correct way of doing it. We don't know, that, yeah. well, maybe there is a correct way, but we don't know what that is. Uh, so we need, we need more work on this. So retrospective analysis are, are part of what needs to be done, not just projecting climate change, but really looking at what can we see has happened over the last 50, 100 years. We have in many cases, good information going back to, certainly for marine ecosystems going back to 1950. That we can start many models back there uh, through many, in many systems, it was the 60s, 70s that saw the big chains, uh, but 50s yeah. is often a good starting point. And uh, certainly if we're looking for climate studies, uh, starting a model in 2020 and using that model to project forward is not very credible because you can't see how that model has behaved. That's uh, looking at this longer time series um, can we replicate what has happened in the system? Gives us, in that process, when we're trying to replicate that, we have to tweak these functions. And maybe we get to a better, hopefully we get into a better representation when we do that. Uh, going back to uh, the beginning of the lecture, uh, about the... Um, uh, connecting uh, or bringing data from another model. And I'm going to do that. Uh, and I'm, I have like, I guess two options. Just bringing uh, nutrients, temperatures uh, into uh, ecosystem or already the, the phytoplankton, the biomass, which is, which is a, preferable? Either works. Uh, you can use nutrients. And uh, the, the, the one thing that uh, is interest that's one interesting thing in EcoSim. Um, let me share my screen. When you go into EcoSim, um, you have something here about base proportion of free nutrients. Um, you and by default it's one, which means there's lots of free nutrients in the ecosystem. Now, if you're working with a nutrient loading forcing function, you can put that in here. So we could make one of these uh, 
a nutrient loading forcing function, which would then be impacting the, the uh, primary production. Nutrients are is often uh, limited in in ecosystems, and in biogeochemical models, you they uh, do this whole calculation of what happens to nutrients and what implication it has for phytoplankton and maybe zooplankton. And it's based on the nutrients that the model sees. That means the upwelling, the interaction, the wind driven uh, processes are important for it. EcoSim can do some of the same, not the water mixing and all of that. It has to get that from the other model. More, making it simple, it doesn't deal with that. What it does know about is how much nutrients there are in, let me show you where the nutrients are. There are nutrients in here, in that, in the biomasses. There's a lot of nutrients in here in an ecosystem. A whale is full of nutrients and so are all the other ones. And they come back into the system as well. So that's the advantage of using this model. It's that we can, uh, the limitation is impacted what's up in that part of the ecosystem. It's not something you, you, you normally hear about, but that is the case. So we can get that angle into, uh, into the, um, the analysis here. We won't get all the processes and what's happening there. And to me, this is another good reason of getting these different models to talk together, to, uh, to explore this kind of questions to how important is this? Well, when we run the model here, uh, it really matters what assumption you put in there for the base proportion of free nutrients. And it's possible to calculate that, how much nutrients there are in all the organisms. It's not trivial. Uh, it's trivial to calculate, but the impact effect of this is not trivial. It's not in, oh, sorry, insignificant is the word I should, I should have used instead of trivial. Uh, it is a significant, significant amount of nutrients that tied in living organisms in an ecosystem. So that's what you can get in here. But the downside is you don't get all the water masses. So communication is great. Another aspect of this is if you have a biochemical model, should you include soil plankton? Who should deal with soil plankton? Uh, we have a, we have, I remember discussing this uh, with a few years ago uh, with Jan Brueggemann, who uh, is behind a lot of biochemical models of different kinds. And, and he's also uh, the creator of something called FABM, F-A-B-M, Framework of FABM, Framework Aquatic Biological Modeling, no, by Geochemical Modeling. It's a, it's, a, it's a framework really neat for taking hydrodynamic models and uh, by geochemical models of different kinds and getting them to talk together. How, how do you get all these models to talk together? And uh, we were then adding uh, EWE to that uh, system there some years ago and worked on, on aspects of different not for the general fatten, but for an application. And Jorn's reaction was, you do zooplankton. And mine was, no, you do zooplankton. You know, we were trying to pass in the buck because sometimes zooplankton can feel like, uh, oh, there are issues with how we deal with this. For the biochemical models, that issue is they don't have anything eating zooplankton. That means so plankton is going to good conditions, you can get more and more and more of them. So you have to kill them. And they put in a closure term that, that's called, which is basically you square the biomass or triple or, or some um, exponent on the biomass to kill them off, get rid of them. We can do better than that. It's simple, but it has some shortcomings. So getting changes in, 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 in the, grazing pressures would be interesting. So the first step could be, well, we just, just use that biogeochemical model as it is. And then we can look from this system here. Uh, we have 
there were many systems. There was a big Norton, Norton temperate systems, I should say. There were uh, in the 60s, 70s, big collapses of the small pelagics. One would expect that to have an implication on zooplankton. So we can look at this and in many other systems there have been those events that have really changed things. And when we're modeling the whole time period, those events are, may well are important for uh, tuning our model, getting our model to behave. Uh, so zooplankton, zooplankton is important. It's not just a buck we're passing. Uh, phytoplankton productivity really is important and getting models to talk together to figure out how best to deal with this is something that is really, really critical for our understanding of the systems and how they work. And uh, therefore, the question that you are raising there about how what, what to do is really fundamental and there isn't one simple answer to it. Yeah, thanks. Okay, folks, thank you very much.